Hey everyone, welcome back to another edition of Daily Doc Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Drew Timmermans. So it's the end of the week and I want to do a weekly recap for you, just kind of talking about uh, some different things that happened. Hopefully that may help you or someone you know uh, with maybe something they're dealing with in their health. And so I want to, there's one particular patient that I have this week that I, that I want to talk about and it has to do with kind of uh, the regenerative injection world, specifically in this patient PRP, and how we decide what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, and the uh, clinical thinking kind of behind all of that. And so I'll set the stage here. I had a 67-year-old female patient come to me this week, and she had PRP about uh, three months ago, and she had seen, and this is for her knee. And she had seen some results with it. The original PRP injection they had done without imaging, so they used a blind approach. They had done intraarticular inside the knee joint, and then they also treated the MCL and the LCL. And that was based uh, in part from the notes that I read, in part from imaging, which showed some mild degeneration, some mild osteoarthritis in the knee joint, as well as clinical exam findings in her history supporting. Uh, intraarticular pain, so knee joint pain, as well as the MCLs, medial and lateral LCL pain. And so over the past three months, she has seen improvement in her knee, mainly with the LCL and the lateral aspect of her knee, only minimal improvement on the inside of her knee uh, around the L MCL, but she didn't really see much improvement with the pain that's coming from inside the joint. And so anytime I'm in this situation, there's a, a kind of like an algorithm kind of checklist or a flow that I go through in my head to figure out what the appropriate next step would be. And so there's four main things that I ask myself uh, or I pose the question uh, to myself, even if you know I wasn't the original one doing the injection. But the four main questions are, was it the correct diagnosis? The second was, um, was it the uh, correct pain generator? So where they injected, is that where the pain is coming from? The third one, was it the correct indication? So was wh whichever injection was done, whether it was prolotherapy, PRP, or stem cell therapy, was it indicated for that particular uh, condition? And then the last one was, was it in the correct location? Because if you inject it into an area that you think you're injecting into one area, but you inject it into a different area, then you might not get a response. And so in terms for her, uh, revisited the drawing board and looked at kind of her history, uh, repeated a lot of the physical exams that were done prior, looked at her imaging, and the diagnosis was correct. She did have some arthritis inside the knee joint, uh, and then she also still had some laxity and some pain along the MCL. And then I also found that the uh, quadriceps attachment uh, the tendon onto the superior aspect of the patella was a pain generator and that wasn't treated in the past. So correct diagnosis, check. The correct pain generator. So this is where we look at the physical exam and there's different ways that we can elicit intraarticular pain versus extraarticular pain. And what I mean by that is inside the joint pain or outside the joint pain. And it was still pretty clear that some of her pain was coming from inside the joint. And so going through our checklist again, correct diagnosis, we still had osteoarthritis. That osteoarthritis was still contributing to her pain. So we've got those first two uh, kind of checked off. The third one is, is it the correct indication? Then, so that, you know, requires knowing what the research, uh, and, you know, both from an academic standpoint, but also a clinical aspect, you know, where those are. And there is supportive evidence for using the regenerative injection therapies for osteoarthritis and PRP being one of those. So we've got correct diagnosis, correct pain generator, and the correct indication. So then the last one just becomes the correct location. And so this is where we, you know, have the discussion, um, both with the patient, but also in my head. So the last physician had done the injection blind. And a lot of the times, Blind injections are more than sufficient to achieve uh, a desired outcome, especially when you're dealing with periarticular structures. It's very easy to palpate where the MCL attaches 
uh, on both the femur and the tibia. Or if you're talking about the shoulder, it's easy to palpate the supraspinatus and its attachment. Where the, the waters kind of get a little muddy is when we start talking about intraarticular injections. And so in the injection world, when we are wanting to put something inside of a joint, there's certain positions we can put the patient in, which is going to open up the joint space and then needle placement and uh, can help as well or is, is required in order to get inside of a knee joint uh, or any joint for that matter. And the other thing that uh, physicians rely on is the feel. And so when you're pushing fluid inside of a fluid filled space, which is what the joint is, it should pass through very easily. If you're trying to put uh, any fluid into a tendon, a ligament, or a muscle, it's going to give you some resistance and feedback, and you're not going to be able to push as easily. And so the interesting thing, though, is that there's different fat pads that are going to be around joints. There's different bursa around joints that are not always continuous with the joint. And so even though a practitioner may feel like they're inside of a joint because it's flowing really easily, they may not actually be inside the joint. And there are some published uh, research statistics on this just showing that even in highly trained, um, you know, orthopedics uh, or PMR physicians, anything like that, that they're, the injections done intraarticular, there's still a percentage of the time that it actually doesn't go intraarticular, even when the physician thinks it was. So that's what I thought was going on with this patient because she had a response to the PRP with the MCL and the LCL, just not with the intraarticular. And so my assumption that I worked off of was that she the uh, PRP didn't initially go inside the knee joint. And so my solution for that is to then use a form of imaging either ultrasound or fluoroscopy in order to visualize the inside of the knee joint to make sure that the PRP was being put inside the knee joint. And so for her and for the knee, I typically tend to use fluoroscopy. So for those of you who don't know, that is a essentially a miniature x-ray that we can then take a still image or we can take live footage uh, of the structure. And then we use a, an injectable contrast media where we inject it in to ensure that the, the dye goes in the correct place, so inside the knee joint, before we put the medicine. And so that, you know, greatly increases the chances, uh, if not confirms, that we are inside the knee joint. And so for her, we repeated the injections that they had done in the past with the MCL, uh, also uh, treated the uh, suprapatellar attachment of the quads tendon, and then put uh, the majority of the PRP inside the knee joint because that's where she was having most of our pain. So that was just this week. So we don't have follow up yet, but um, I will follow up in a later video talking just about how she did in comparison, because I think that that distinction and that understanding is really important on when imaging is really valuable and when it may not be. Needed. So I hope everyone here had a great week. Thank you again for tuning in. I appreciate you all. And if you can, give this a like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time.